Okay, well, uh, I guess it's good afternoon. Uh, I, it's my privilege to introduce our speaker for the day, Professor Chilin Liang. Uh, Professor Liang graduated with a PhD from USC and uh, worked for a few years with, as a member of the technical staff for Hughes. And then in, 19, in 2002, he joined the electrical engineering department here at UTR. Uh, Professor Liang has been very successful. Uh, He's won a number of prestigious awards. He is the winner of an ONR, Office of Naval Research Young Investigator Award, uh, an Air Force uh, Young uh, Faculty Summer Fellowship. He's the winner of a few different awards here at UTA, outstanding young faculty member uh, several years back. Uh, I think two years ago, College of Engineering Excellence and Research Award. And just this last year, UTA uh, out, uh, record of, uh, of, let's see, I gotta read the, Outstanding Research Achievement Creative Accomplishment. I always forget that one. That's a little hard to remember that one. Uh, but anyway, you know, that's a pretty significant award across the whole campus here. Uh, Professor Liang has uh, been involved with uh, projects over $6 million of funding as either PI or co-PI. Uh, this is primarily from Office of Naval Research, National Science Foundation, and uh, Air Force Office of Scientific Research. Uh, let's see, Professor Liang has over 70 I believe, uh, referee journal publications now, uh, given over 150 uh, quality conference presentations, has two uh, best paper awards, uh, pretty noteworthy, uh, holds four patents, and uh, so let's see, is there anything else I was on the list here? Uh, you can see it's pretty long. Uh, Professor Liang has uh, three areas of research I'll just mention that kind of re relate to the topic he'll be talking about today. He has uh, research going on radar sensor networks. He has research in the area of smart grid wireless networks and also efficient use of the radio wave spectrum. His lab, as part of his lab now, he's currently supervising eight PhD students. That's the number I saw last, okay. So anyway, um, we look forward to your talk and like you to all welcome Professor Liang. Thank you, John. Thanks for Central Library for having me here. And thanks for my, my colleague, my friends, my student for having an empathy stomach and still being here. <laughs> <coughs> and then, uh, actually, we are still looking, actually, we are still waiting for the laptop to come in because uh, you know, I saw this laptop here, but eventually, not. My student go back to my office to pick up the laptop. And then, uh, what I should do is uh, maybe just uh, just uh, say something before you know the laptop come. I don't know how long it takes. Uh, <laughs> maybe uh, like one or two minutes, and then actually this is the first time I come to UTA library <laughs> for <laughs> eleven years, <laughs> and then it's not surprised because. I quite often I log into UT library via you know internet, but physically that's the first time uh, you know, I come here. Thanks for John you know to bring me here. Because otherwise I get lost. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I joined UT in the year 2002, almost the same time as uh, this uh, uh, focus on faculty speaker at that time was inaugurated, and then that has been 11 years. All the pictures show in the in the poster was uh, at that time when I joined UTA. I was young at that time. Right now I have gray hair, so it's, uh, <laughs> it looks different. So, but anyway, so uh, today my talk will be engineering big data in wireless sensor network. It is the art or it's a science. Because when Maggie tried to ask me to give a talk, I think about it, this is a campus-wide talk which kind of title should I use to attract more audience? So that's why in one title I have four college, engineering college, have science, have art, I even have, a, what is the other one? It's a, uh, I remember, I also talked about psychology, so that is in the, in the abstract. You know, that maybe belongs to social work, so it belongs to science, I don't remember. So hopefully we draw lots of audience which has a very diverse background, which are able to judge my work, and then further, we can trigger some uh, collaboration, uh, you know, among you know the faculties, uh, you know, at UTA. Uh, 
the big data was, uh, uh, I remember the year 2012, ISF and NIH, they initiated the big data initiative, mainly talk about in wireless sensors, in internet, in video, and even in the, uh, you know, different kind of uh, media, they will have uh, all the big data uh, going on. <coughs> and then, uh, ISF initiated last year, this year I think they did not give us call for a proposal, however they gave us a uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, letter to see that whether you have some idea to contribute. They want to see whether in this community you have some fresh idea who can contribute this big data initiative. Uh, I talk about the engineering big data in wireless and networks, art of science. Uh, first, give some introduction for the outline. Uh, I introduce what is big data, and then I present it in two approach. One is uh, from information theoretical approach, and uh, another one is uh, from a human inspired approach. Uh, then I give a compression. You know, <clears throat> you know, I compress. You know, I I compare all these uh, two different approaches, and then I give some discussions. Uh, what is big data actually already mentioned before my student come, mainly just uh, uh, you know, email, internet, video, a sensor, all this data. Uh, in terms of research uh, community, I noticed uh, NIH, they focus more a lot on biomedical. And then for science, for NSF, they focus more on engineering, and then computer, and uh, uh, all that. Also notice business school, they also have uh, uh, start working on the big data center or anything for the business. So anyway, you know that all this have uh, you know from different way based on their domain of knowledge attack this problem from a, a different perspective view. Uh, what's the challenge? What's the challenge? Uh, back to this year in May, there is one uh, one paper in Scientific America. They talk about big data needs a big theory to go with it. Uh, why they said it? Because they said in industry revolution at that time, uh, we, at that time the laws of thermodynamics was uh, uh, generated. They hope that based on the big data in this scenario, whether it's possible, we can get universal laws of complexity to solve our in a big data problem. Uh, actually, the reason why we say change because so far we don't have unified and uh, conceptual framework for addressing the big data complexity problem. For example, we don't know how much data we need. We don't know what kind of data we need. And also we don't know how can you make decision based on enormous amount of data. So that's what we try to you know, based on my approach, I try to, uh, you know, present it from an uh, engineering uh, approach. Another one is uh, from a psychology point of view to give uh, some uh, approach. At the end, I compare these two approaches. Uh, I talk about right now, there's, uh, you know, different uh, funding agency, they have a different kind of effort to try to push this big data area further. For example, in this month, just in, in September, uh, maybe last week, uh, DOD has a uh, uh, MURI. MURI is called Multiple, Multiple University uh, Research Initiative. Uh, used to be $5 million per, per project. Right now, they increase to $7.5 million per project just for one topic, just for one team. This time, they have $7.5 million for topic 10, which is on the computational foundation of mathematics and information. That is big data. Why they said, you know, we need uh, to invest 7.5 million on this effort because they claim that Shannon invented information theory there back to 1948. And then Turing invented Turing machine back to 1936. Actually, after that, they have been dominated this communication and then mathematics uh, since the first half of the 20th century. However, in the big data age, 
big data age, all these Shannon and the Turing framework, they need to be revised to account for not only the magnitude, multitude of the data type, but also many advanced algorithms are needed, especially in terms of mathematical reasoning and also computational procedures. So my approach today is give two approach. One is the information theory, which is coming from Shannon. Another one is uh, talk about psychology, which mainly uh, talk about human-inspired computing, that is from uh, Turing. So eventually, I just give you two talks, which is kind of in the framework of Shannon and Turing. However, we address the big data uh, problem. My approach mainly, as I said, from uh, two approaches. One is uh, the Shannon information theory approach. Try to see that we have the big data. Whether if we want to do compression and the processing, the information theory could be applied to push this area further. The second approach, a human-inspired approach, is because as a human, we know that how to process, because I see my colleague um, Pauline, uh, she's not a technical person. I want to give her some interest so that let her engage this kind of uh, research. <laughs> so then I talk about something that everybody who understand, it, even the staff people who understand it is, as a human, we have ears, right? We are listening, we are able to listen. We have eyes, we are able to see. We also have touching, even we close the eye, we know that is that's microphone. And then all these sensors, they are unified perfectly in our brain to process all this different data, all this different data. And then this kind of mechanism actually are able to translate to the wireless sensor devices so that give wireless sensor devices this such capability to process all this heterogeneous data. That is uh, the second approach I try to use. Uh, in, the, in the ad, I put a psychology. Eventually, it's based on human psychology mechanism to process all this data. So that is uh, today's uh, two approaches. One is the Shannon approach, uh, information theory, and another one is the human uh, inspired approach. My first approach talk about engineering big data in wireless sensor network, mainly from uh, information theoretical approach. Traditionally, we always see that more information is better. More information is better. We want to hire someone, we just uh, try to dig you know, different background, Google this guy online, every information connected and combine together. At the end, we make a decision. And that, that's traditional way. That means more data is always good. We try to fuse every possible data, all the information to make decision. However, such approach in big data age, that is computational challenging, very challenging and also even operationally ineffective, ineffective, and also impossible for big data, especially for military applications. If we want to strike any target, if we keep, keep processing, keep uh, you know, digging, then sometimes we lose the timing, we lose the timing. So what we want to do is, here I propose an algorithm, it's called opportunistic sensing. Opportunistic sensing eventually is I try to select a subset, a small subset of the data, or sensors, which are able to make decisions very quickly without losing the quality of my decision. So that is my approach, it's called opportunistic sensing. And then mathematically, I want to uh, just uh, put a certain mathematics so that to entertain uh, my student, otherwise they don't feel the challenge. <laughs> <laughs> and then, see, Right now, the sensor, I have N sensors, N sensors. And then, whether it's possible, I based on optimistic sensing to select N prime number of sensors. N prime is much, is less than N, N, less than N. And then, since I select a subset of sensors, for sure, I have distortion. The distortion are defined by the expectation of before you do the uh, you do the uh, selection, after you do the selection, you have this distortion. The distortion function is defined by the data fusion results, that difference, data fusion results. For example, if I use a one eye, I cover one eye, I will be able to see that UTA faculty, a staff and a student are you know, coming to this seminar. If I use two eyes, it's the same results. 
So that means from this point of view, I did not lose any kind of uh, information. So that's from data fusion point of view, I did not lose any information. That's why I have a distortion D to mirror this uh, you know, distortion. And then after I take expectation of this distortion, I further apply this distortion to read the distortion function. That means that this read the distortion function is mirror that suppose you, you keep the distortion less than threshold D, and then before and after you do the uh, sensor selection, you have a mutual information. The read the distortion function are defined by the minimal mutual information before and after you do the detection, and the constraint, the distortion has to be less than a threshold. And then some folks may say, what's the use of this one? Actually, this one is a read the distortion R give you a threshold. That means if I want to represent this whole event, as long as, as my coding rate is greater than this threshold, that means I will not lose any information. I just use the number of code words equal to 2 to the power of LR. L is the number of uh, the length of the code word. For example, how many bits you in one code word, how many bits in one code word, and then R, R is the rate. For example, a half, one third, or whatever. And then this absolute value does not mean it's absolute value, that means the number of code words. Then you notice if I have lower R, and then this value is smaller, that means I just need very few code words to represent this whole monitoring events. That means I reduce the data, right? I reduce the data. And then the distortion and also you know, representing the D. If, the, if my represented data, R, the read, is less than this RD, that means no such code exists. That means no hope. No hope you can keep the, so you and Pauline you know, <laughs> agree with that. <laughs> okay, so no code exists. That means the RD, if you can get RD, that is a good thing. That means you are able to tell what is the bottleneck. If you are able to meet this requirement, you are able to represent these events using much less of data. So that is uh, my philosophy over here. And then the next one, I have two scenarios. One scenario is we know that all these wireless sensor networks, they will have different modality. For example, even in this room, you will have a monitoring for the video and then, and then recording the video. Another one, you have microphone to catch my, my voice. On the other hand, you have light, uh, you have light sensor and then you are able to also have thermal sensor detect whether there's a fire, there's a fire or give you know, water. So many different sensors in this room. The question is, how could you fuse all this sensor collection and then make your uh, data reduction? So we have two scenarios. One is independent modality. Another one is correlated modality. What is correlated modality? For example, I have a light sensor and I also have a thermal sensor. Generally, if I have more light in this room, most likely this room temperature is warmer. It's warmer because it's correlated. On the other hand, I have the, this video sensor. Video sensor just catch my, my voice. Uh, actually, not voice, just catch the image. The acoustic sensor just catch the, the voice. Actually, they are independent. Regardless of how loud I shout, the, the video sensor, you just catch the image, right? The video sensor just catch. In that case, they are independent. So these two scenarios, one is independent, another one is correlated. So these are two scenarios I try to uh, handle. Uh, with independent modality, uh, based on the mutual information between these two modalities, X and Y, for example, one is video, another one is acoustic, assume that uh, you have M sensor, you have N sensors at the beginning, initially you collect it. And then what I do is, after opportunistic sensing, only M prime sensors with modality X and M prime sensor with modality Y, they are left. See, F, F means the opportunistic sensing reduction, the left. After the left, what I do is, I want to mirror the mutual information before and after. Before I, before I do reduction, after I do reduction, that mutual information I'm able to compute because X and Y, 
they are independent. So I'm able to get the mutual information between x before and after and the y before and after that summation. And then similarly, for the rate distortion, which is just like the minimal mutual information given a certain distortion, and then you will be able to get that is rate distortion function for a modality x plus rate distortion for modality y. And then if I have more modality sensors, for example, I have a acoustic, have video, and also have, a, uh, have a, uh, other sensors, for example, vibration, to test whether this building is uh, in good condition, they are also independent. Then further, I extend it into more modality, which has <coughs> an M modality. Very similar, this M modality could be decomposed. Each modality, there is a distortion function uh, summation. So that means independent modality sensor, it is equal to each modality sensor, their summation. So we just need to analyze the rate distortion function for a single modality sensor, which simplify our work tremendously. So that is independent. The next one is correlated. We know correlated one is more complicated, more complicated. For example, uh, if uh, the, 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 the thermal catch the temperature is higher and then in this room and also the light is quite uh, you know quite uh, bright most likely there's some correlated information there so in that case what we, we want to do is we want to mirror that after you do the reduction n prime and n prime how much information you need to keep and then the mutual information between X and Y, these are correlated, uh, correlated modality, you'll notice that's equal to mutual information uh, X before after mutual information Y before and after. And then you need to minus their cross modality, cross modality between X and Y. You need to reduce that. And then once you reduce that corresponding to the distortion function, that means what you want to do is you just equal to the modality for x plus modality for y, but you need to minus that mutual information. So you get rate distortion function, the rate is lower. The rate lower is good or is bad? It is good because once you get lower rate, that means in the two to the power LR, you have less number of code words. That means you have less number of code words, you are able to represent this whole uh, you know, information collection, which is a good thing. And then, so I give one theorem. Theorem tells you that for, in, for correlated modality, their mutual inform, their rate distortion function equal to each independent rate distortion minus their mutual information. And also the joint uh, distortion function for independent modality, as what I have said before, that will be equal to each one independently. So that is for two sensors for two modality sensor, does not mean for two sensor, two modality sensor. And then for three correlated modality, if we have three modalities, and then we'll be able to see that will be equal to each independent modality in mutual information minus their cross correlated mutual information, like x1, x2, minus x1, x3, and also x2 and x3. Correspondingly, the rate distortion function can be represented into each rate distortion and then minus their uh, correlated mutual information. That means you have correlated modality, you need to have less data to represent this one. I give you theorem two tells you that if you have M modality sensors, M modality sensor, their uh, rate, rate distortion function, there will be each equal to each independent one minus their cross correlated, each correlated uh, cross modality information. And if they are independent, definitely this item will be reduced. I think I have given you enough math, right? You have had it. <laughs> okay, now I want to entertain you with real world data. Uh, this real world data is collected by Air Force I work in Air Force in the summer 2007, 2009, 2010. At that time, uh, the Air Force uh, lab, they collect the data uh, in Massachusetts in the later summer and fall. Let me show you the picture. There's Massachusetts, it's much uh, green than 
Texas, <laughs> much greener than Texas. And then the data collected based on the radar, which is in the lift, in the lift. And then the target are located in one, uh, 300 feet away from the, the lift. The target is uh, kind of uh, um, uh, trihedral reflector, which is 100, uh, which is uh, 300 feet away. You notice in such dense forest, if it's uh, 300 away from uh, the radar, if you don't use radar, if you use video sensor, you you are not able to catch the target, right? Because like 300 feet away, almost like 100 meter away, that is very far. And also the, the forests are so dense, you can never catch the target. However, I'm able to do is based on radar sensor network. That is based on radar sensor network. For the data we collected, the data is very kind of high resolution, high resolution data. You notice each sample is 50 picosecond, it's 10 to minus uh, 12. And then uh, 16,000 samples were collected in 0 0.8 microseconds. So that's why it's big data. Even 0 0.8 microseconds, you have 16,000 uh, samples. If I keep collecting, I believe the central library, you, you have no space to store all this data, <laughs> right? So that is a big challenge, big challenge. <coughs> and then my purpose is try to detect this target even 300 feet away. At the beginning, so I, I show you what is the the, the, the pulse, the radar sending. That's the UW radar transmit pulse. That means they are sending this one. They will get echo, they will get echo. So the echo looks like this. Uh, the A, figure A is no target. That means 300 feet away, there's no target. I get this data. And B is with target. That means I have the target there, I get this target. I get this uh, echo. So then you notice know, that is the transmitted, that's the receive, that's the receive. The challenge thing is whether you are able to, based on the echo, to detect there is a target, target your interest. You know, some audience think that's easy, you just have a B minus A, you get the target signature, right? That's a straightforward way. However, it's not that easy because in the forest, the leaves, the stems, they keep moving in the wind. So in this time you collect it, the next time you collect it, everything changed, everything changed. So because the target is located about 300 feet away and the, the, the radar signal propagate follows the speed of the light, which is three times 10 to the power eight. In that case, I'm able to compute the target is located by the sample 3900, 3900. This here, I plot all the 16,000 samples I want to zoom in to this small region to see what it really looks like. Okay, so I zoom in, I notice at 13,000 to 15,000, that is all the sample looks like, no target with target, okay? So now I want to use B minus A. I try to get the target signature, okay? I get this one. Looks like I cannot find anything. I cannot find anything. The reason, as I said, that's different with, uh, you know, uh, my, my student working a lot on the sense through wall. Just like in this building, you, you are able to detect the target on the other side of the wall. That's because the wall does not move, right? The wall, the, that means the clutter, the background does not move. However, in this case, the background moving. So, so that's why the Air Force, uh, you know, uh, the lab, they collect the data. I think they collect the data for two years. They cannot figure out where's the target. Uh, until I went there in 2007, so I started working on that. I usually I find the target for them. Uh, later they transfer this kind of piece of work go to their uh, Air Force product. <coughs> so that is a difference. So that means the difference does not make any difference. So, and then what I do is so I use a, a yeah yeah sure. So when you have this situation, are you following the same path? You 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 first will just send the radar signal there and then. There's no target, and then you put target there, mm -hmm. and then you go the same path. Yeah, same path. Yeah, same. However, because the the leaf they are out of your control. So, yeah. And then what I do is I use a sensor network approach because each radar sensor uh, they are able to just like one guy shouted, all the people here listen. 
So whether it's possible, all the, all the listen signal are combined together and then at the end make a decision. You know, so what I do is I try to combine using this uh, rig structure. So all the voice you collected, or not the voice, all the echo you collected based on the weighted average, weighted average, and then weighted average is once you have a higher signal for the, for the echo, you give a higher weight. So the weight are determined by this one, normalized. And uh, also at the end, you combine together. Actually, later I found even I combine it together, it does not solve the problem. However, if I observe carefully, I notice if this target looks like 3900 over there, there's a target, the signal going up and down change much faster than there's no target. If I explain why that happened, because the metal try uh, try a uh, try hydro reflector, they are metal, so they reflect the, the radar signal much stronger than the wood, than the wood, than the ground. Actually, it's much better than human because human eventually absorb the signal. You know, the metal reflect the signal. So once it's much stronger, they are able to make the signal up and down quite often. So based on that one, I go to the uh, I take a DCT, DCT this, uh, because I care about their uh, frequency domain knowledge. So I take DCT. Once I take DCT, I plot it. I notice at 3900, you notice there's target. 3900, you notice there's a, there's a very strong uh, the loop. This power loop tells you that it's up and down because this uh, metal gives very strong reflection. All the others, Although they are up and down, but it looks like very much uh, fluctuate. The reason because, think about it, this is made from uh, the stem of a tree. This tree is reflected, however, the stem because they're moving, so they give you kind of random. That's why it looks like very much like noise. However, this, this, this target looks like up and down, very much deterministic. It's not random. However, in here, there's no target. It looks like everything behaves like noise. You cannot find the target. So based on this way, we are able to find the target in 3900. That is based on 30 radar. That's based on 30 radar. Today, what's the theme of today's topic? It's big data, big data. That is big data. But do, are we happy with this one? The answer is no, because I want to do the reduction. So further, I want to do reduction is based on the uh, opportunistic sensing I just uh, said because whenever we want to do opportunistic sensing we want we need to compute the mutual information the mutual information you need to know the probability so here I show you the histogram of this data see the his histogram histogram I plotted the histogram for the real data that looks like that's exactly Gaussian the red dot one dash one means the ideal Gaussian the blue bar means the actual histogram. So it looks like that's exactly Gaussian. That means that the, the radar echo is follows Gaussian distribution. Once it's follow Gaussian distribution, I'm able to apply this one to the rate distortion function, which is RD. RD. Because I totally have 30 radars. So I have 30 radars I plug in. I compute once I plug in Gaussian, I'm able to get the rate distortion function based on this one. And also the D because the D is the total distortion for all the radars. And for each radar, the distortion are determined based on if you have higher uh, virus, then I have lambda. The lambda value will be lower than this. If you have lower virus, I will choose sigma i squared as the distortion. If I, uh, the total summation equal to the total distortion D. If I plot these relations in the figure, that will look like this one. Each bar here corresponding to the virus of all the echo signals. The one which has a higher the virus, I will give a, you know, follow that one based on distortion uh, lambda. See, the distortion lambda. Otherwise, I choose sigma i. That is called reverse water feeling. Reverse water feeling. Reverse water feeling, that means you always favor the one which has higher uh, signal uh, power, which is the signal power shows here. And then if you have 
lower one, if you have lower one, that means you don't you don't give any kind of uh, attention on this. So that is called reverse water feeling. So that's why we only choose a constant lambda. And then based on lambda, and we are able to find that how many how many symbols, actually not symbols, how many radars you need to decide. Corresponding to the you know, corresponding to the uh, data fusion function gx bar, we, are, we need to choose m hat corresponding sensors. That means we just choose m hat highest virus. That means from all these 30 sensors, we choose the, the one which has highest virus. And then we choose file. That means we choose the highest file, m sensors, uh, m equal to file. This we only choose five sensors, and then the reduction ratio is uh, 6 to 1. Uh, correspondingly, that means in the data reduction, we have six sensor, choose one sensor. Totally, we have 30 sensor, we choose five. And then let's see the performance. The performance for this one, and it looks like in the figure A, that is the one opportunistic sensing algorithm I use. See, looks like the target, you are still able to detect the target. However, if I randomly choose five sensors, so that means I choose five sensor looks like here. You are not able to find the target because in 3900 even don't have any slope. But over here you have very high slope. So that means I'm able to detect the target with only five radar. So based on this one, you notice opportunistic sensing works very well to find the target. On the other hand, I have 30 radar I reduced to five. So that is a my approach we use, which is a information theory approach. The second approach I want to use is a human-inspired approach. Human-inspired approach. <coughs> For human-inspired approach, uh, that is, uh, as I mentioned, human has multiple modality sensors equipped in the human already. And then all these all this neurons in our brain are able to coordinate all these different modalities. This one, uh, that one is called uh, prefrontal cortex, PFC. In the PFC, I draw the figure shows that is in one brain, in one brain area, uh, that is called PFC, prefrontal cortex. You notice they have many different uh, regions, but they are able to process different modality information. We are able to process visual information, uh, ventral information, we are able to uh, auditory information, multimodal information, all these informations you are able to uh, process based on unified region. See, that is a you know, different area. They are able to process multiple modality of information. Area 46, area 9, all they are able to process this multiple modality information. And then the question is, how this one works. What is the mechanism our human brain are using? Actually, the human brain using using this mechanism to process this. Here, I give you one psychology test. What kind of color of this world? What color of this world? Red. 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 It's not green. <laughs> Actually, for people who have brain problem, they like to see this is green. The reason because as uh, you know, as all the people surrounding here are very knowledgeable, you know word gives you a much stronger stimulus than the color, than the color. So that's why you see the green, you saw it's green. Actually it's red, the color is red. Why human brain are able to process this information, give you the, the, the answer is red instead of green, it is because they have top down control or it's called Fever weak me mechanism. If I draw a figure shows here, figure A that means no control. No control that means uh, if uh, uh, you know that is very small font. But mainly A is no control. B is you have human control. You are able to tell. See that is the word. That is the word uh, control uh, region. That is uh, no. That is the color. Okay. That is the color. That is the word. That means your knowledge control that. So once your knowledge control that, so you notice the color one over here, they give you a stronger, compare this one, they give you a stronger 
a control, once you give a stronger control, you are able to identify the color is uh, red, it's not a green, it's, it's red, it's not green. So because you, you are able to control this one, this mechanism is called, uh, this mechanism is called uh, top-down control, or you can see fewer weak mechanism. In psychology, I, I'm not sure whether you know, the audience, some people work in psychology, Any, anyone work on psychology? If uh, no one works on psychology, I feel comfortable, otherwise, <laughs> <laughs> be careful. <laughs> okay, so this one is, taught, is called Stroop Task. Stroop Task is a very common psychology experiment to test people whether you are able to handle you know, this kind of test easily. Actually, the word green display in red, however, you are able to tell people that in red color because you use fewer weak, because your red color is, uh, is weak compared to the green word. And then, because there is a strong uh, you know, a tendency to read, to read the word green and which compete with uh, the color red. However, human brain is able to control it. And then, Right now is the question is whether we are able to translate this fever weak mechanism goes to the uh, uh, you know sensor network decision. So that means we need to translate such mechanism to modeling such mechanism into mathematical in inference, and this motivates us to design a fever weak fuzzy logic system. Fuzzy logic system was uh, initially was a uh, uh, proposed by a lot of his other in 1968 from UC Berkeley. He's still alive. He's, uh, he's, 90, he's 93, 93 years old, but he's still writing paper, writing single author paper, single author paper. So uh, uh, to, to do that, and then uh, what I want to do, I try to mimic this mechanism into human, uh, into the fuzzy logic system. to do just a restart me. Hardly surf. Huh? What? Hardly surf. Just start it over, you know, just shut it over. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's yeah. what I think that is uh, the easiest way you just shut down and then. Oh, yes. you know. okay. Okay. Maybe you the encryption. <laughs> Sense there's some uh, kind of sensitive information going on, so they just stop. <laughs> I heard they want to do laptop uh, encryption this year, right? That's not last year. That was last year. No, no, no. Laptop is uh, laptop was last year. This year they want to do desktop. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, that's a good time. So uh, when you have, let's say, initially 30 uh, uh, radars, yeah, yeah. and then you know what's your acceptable distortion rate, so you can determine that six radars are enough to, de to detect the signal that you're looking for. Actually, that is still an open question, because the, in the real world, you know, it's hard to judge which distortion are acceptable. Exactly. Exactly. So in, in my case, I just use the top five. Actually, that's your open question is, how could you see that file is good enough? In my case, because they are able to detect the target. Actually, does not mean that is the optimum. So that's still open question. Because in real world, for example, if I see I have a, you know, six, you know, 30 microphone over here, I reduce to file, but the question is the distortion, you know, 
In the real world, you wouldn't have 30 so that you can compare. Initially. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. How do you yeah. determine that five compares good to compared to the? Yeah, that will, that's your open question. That means whether whether you can judge that uh, uh, that file it is the optimal choice. We know that you are able to select a small subset. Yeah, but what's the? Yeah, what is the optimal? Enough? Yeah, what is the optimal? Like in my case, theoretically, I said I uh, based on the distortion, but practically. The distortion only happens is when you see that I'm able to detect the target. Yeah. Actually, there's no boundary to see whether I'm able to detect or not. It's just based on, on your judgment to see I'm able to detect. So, uh, if you don't know math, don't, don't leave because right now there's no more math. You just like <laughs> psychology. Okay, so, uh, so that means uh, I want to do use a fewer wave first logic system. Current first logic system design actually they are fewer strong, fewer strong. That means once you have, you know, stronger signal, they give you the highest membership function. That's called fewer strong, right? No one said fewer weak. Just like uh, you, when I choose student, I always choose the the one with the the, the best uh, performer performance, not the worst performance. However, here the question is, I want to choose the one weakest as, uh, as my uh, favor. So in that case, because in the stroop task, you know, the, the green I display in red, so I want to favor the color, so that's why I make the weak signal as red. Since in the current physiologic system design, there is uh, no such mechanism, so I need to reinvent such mechanism. So what I do is uh, I, I just use a different membership degree to, to see whether this one I favor or I not favor, different membership degree. And also I use multiple membership degree, so that's why I use a interval fuzzy sets. I also use a upper membership function for favor and the lower membership function for no control. Yeah, this is a membership function I draw over here. If you don't, uh, if you don't, uh, if you don't know this one, that's not a surprise to me because actually uh, I invented this uh, interval type two fuzzy logic system back to the year 2000. Back to the year 2000. At that time, that is the first paper on the interval type two fuzzy logic system. And then, so you notice whenever I have one input, I have two degree. One is lower, another one is upper. Right? I have two degree, lower and upper. And then for the fewer weak mechanism, what I represent here, use the upper membership degree. If there is no control, I use the lower membership degree. So the rules, the rules which is uh, very similar as the existing fuzzy logic system, however, if you don't know fuzzy logic system, actually just like link with the kind of uh, people's judgment. For example, if, uh, if uh, tomorrow will rain and uh, Tomorrow, the, the instructor will not uh, give a pop-up quiz, I will not go to school. Then, I will not go to school. That if then, it's very clearly linked with your linguistic language, right? Link with your linguistic language. So that's if then rule. And then in a further logic system, they also have antecedent. Antecedent, like in, in the example I gave it to you, is tomorrow's weather and also the instructor personality, right? The, you know, if there is no, no quiz, and then you just, uh, you know, don't go to school uh, because of the rain. And then, uh, so here we only have, we assume that the first W antecedent, they are weak and you should be favored. All the other antecedent, they are uh, no control. So in that case, what I should do is, uh, sorry, there's one more math, you just like, uh, just uh, briefly show you that is, that is all the membership degree, you fire this membership degree, that's why the first W are upper, so that's the upper membership functions. The, the, the remaining are lower, so that's why you have lower one. And then the output, you just based on the fire membership degree, you time the consequence, you get the output. And based on the output, you are able to get the output first set. You are able to defertify this first set at the end, give you output. So this one is another fuzzy system model, which is a type one fuzzy, uh, fuzzy sets, uh, 
uh, being fired. So you notice here there is a, there's no bar. Over here there's an upper bar. Over here there's lower bar. That's because in the fuzzy fire only fuzzy fire into a type one, not a type two. And the, this one is another case is actually there is a no fuzzy fire, just have single tank. Single tank that means you just have uppers for each uh, antecedent membership degree and then lowers for all the re remaining uh, you know, membership degree. At the end, I need to give some remarks. Although you know this fuel wave fuzzy logic system actually it works very well because it does not need very complicated uh, iteration. Or another one is this fuel wave fuzzy logic system actually they are embedded into a type two fuzzy logic system, which is much simple. You just, you can directly compute it without uh, doing complicated optimization. And also the fuel wave fuzzy logic system take the physical meaning linguistic meaning into computing, so which are able to mathematically compute the linguistic knowledge into your decision. So here I give you one, uh, one kind of uh, application example. Application example because back to a few years ago, uh, ONR has uh, one Muri project, which is a human, human inspired uh, situation awareness, situation awareness. So situation awareness, what situation awareness like uh, recently in Kenya? In Kenya, it's on the weekend in Kenya, Nairobi, right? Nairobi, there's a, there's a terrorist attack, like uh, how many people died? It's a lot, like more than 30 people died. So that kind of attack actually could be able to detect based on the situation awareness, situation awareness. For example, the situation awareness you could do is based on the target. The target could be a human or could be some kind of helicopter, or could be some kind of other vehicle, anything. It's a target. If the target rarely appears in the sensor field, for example, if this, this terrorist never shows up in this uh, shopping mall, that's the first time they show up in the shopping mall. On the other hand, these people, they have, a, they have a, uh, for example, they have, they have a weapon concealed in there Closing, that's easily you can, you can detect because the radar, you are able to detect whether people you have concealed weapon based on the metal detection. So if some person already show up in such shopping mall and also they also have concealed weapon and also even based on his voice, you are able to detect there is some certain data, database. Because in, in the US, we have not to fly uh, list, right? You're able to check whether the people are in this list. Actually, the voice also should be in the database. Based on the voice, you're able to detect whether these people are kind of suspected uh, servant. In that case, you are able to detect. Another way, the behavior pattern of this target uh, has low match with existing one in the database. For example, if aircraft, if they just fly like this, that's normal. If they fly like, like this one, then suddenly, though, that is an abnormal. That is abnormal. From a military point of view, it's maneuvering. Maneuvering pattern quite often change. That means it's a suspect. It's suspect. You never see a, a air flight, which is a flight to DFW, they're doing this one, right? But however, sometimes the, you know, the, the suspected the target they want to do is they do very kind of strange pattern. Another one is space-time correlation on the data entities to the event. As I said, the terrorists, most of the cases, that's the first time they go to the shopping mall, that shopping mall. That kind of space and the time correlation, that's also another information. Could be obtained based on the assumption, you know, that high quality information about the object are available. You know, we are able to combine together to make a situation awareness. So this one, I'll give you one example is, uh, in this example, assume that heterogeneous sensor network, they have radar. They also have image video sensor. They also have GPS. We are able to choose based on the if-then rules is if the number of switches from non-maneuvering sets, non-maneuvering, that means constant behavior in speed, acceleration, and direction, just like the air flight in the DFW is just like that. However, to maneuvering, maneuvering set, maneuvering is the varying behavior in speed, acceleration, and direction. 
just like as I, as I have you know, said like that. So generally, this kind of switches is quite often, then it's, it's very suspect. Another one is the frequency appearance of such target. That's uh, what I said in that shopping mall. Most like cases that people really show up in that shopping mall. Another one is, for example, in 911, you really see WTC building, uh, you, you have an air, aircraft in that closing area. Another one is the importance of geolocation. Ge ge for example, the, you know, the White House and then even the WTC that building, that geographically, that is very important location. And then based on the GRS, based on this information, you are able to tell. So that means based on all this information, you are able to set up uh, a rule. For example, if the number of switches from non-manuring sets to the manuring set is higher, and then frequency appearance of such target is low, and also the important ge geography location of such target is higher, then the possibility that an indication of warning should be issued is very strong. That means in such cases, you need to give very strong warning. And then, uh, so that is a combine all this antecedent in this rule. You notice over here, there is antecedent, like the frequency appearance of such target, actually it should be fewer, because once it's low, that means you need to strongly fewer this uh, antecedent. So, and also the, the antecedent we also have low, moderate, high, that means each italic value over here is high, could be low, could be moderate, low could be moderate and high combination altogether. So totally you have 27 rules, 27 rules. And then when I compute it, I'm able to compute these 27 rules once based on this, you know, this computing. You notice antecedent one is lower because there's no, no reason you need to control. And then antecedent three is lower. However, antecedent two, it is higher. You need strongly to favor this lower value. Lower value, that means appearance of such target. Then you normalize, and then here I draw uh, my example is uh, if I have x3 equal to 8, suppose that everything are normalized from, one, from 0 to 10, everything are normalized from 0 to 10. If I fix the you know, geographic location as 8, it means that's important. I'm able to plot this one in the, in the, in the figure. That is the membership degree, I, membership function I use for antecedent and the consequent. And then here, that is the decision surface. Decision surface. You notice I use a fever weak fuzzy logic system versus the traditional fuzzy logic system. You notice I have x3 equal to 8. I have x1, x2 keep different, different value changing. You notice, and then for this one, for the fever weak fuzzy logic system, they are able to give you the indication warning possibility goes to 9, goes to 9. However, over here, they can only give you possibility to go to seven. So that means the figure of the further logic system are really able to give you very high indication and warning um, based on you know, this figure of the mechanism compared to A and B. Uh, so based on this observation, you notice uh, in this figure, figure, figure 13, notice figure of the they give you very high possibility for this target if this target is a threat, which makes sense because the weak factor, the frequency appearance of such kind of target is, has been favored. So our proposed fuzzy logic system, which are fever weak mechanism, increase the probability for indication and warning. And then compare, compare these two approaches. I want to give some discussion is, in the first approach, I use information theoretical approach. In the second approach, I use a human PFC mechanism, uh, fever weak mechanism. However, this may contradict with each other because the first one, the first one, remember I talk about the virus. Once the virus is higher, I choose that, uh, that radar, right? The second approach, if it's lower probability, I choose that one. So that means they are really contradict each other. So that means really let people think about, is it really an art or is a science to do all this kind of bigger data process? Bigger data process, is it art or is science? If it's a science, that means everything should be very rigid. You need to have follow the same kind of reasoning. If it's art, that means 
it really depends on your kind of uh, different people, your, you have different kind of flavor, personality, you make a decision. So that is really an uh, open question. So the conclusion <coughs> is, I overview the challenge, opportunity of big data. Also presented two approaches, one is the information theoretical approach, another one is uh, called, you know, uh, human inspired approach. We also show that for correlated modality, we are able to have much lower rate. That means you are able to seal more storage and use much less data. And also, the results may contradict each other, as I just mentioned. So which just trigger a question is, is it art or is it science for this kind of problem? Uh, that is my, you know, my talk. And then the further reference is, uh, uh, I give you two references. The first part has been accepted to publish in actually transactions on computers, that is uh, on opportunistic setting. The second part of the work has been published in actually system journal uh, in two years ago. So that is uh, just, I, I unify these two pieces of work into, the, uh, into today's talk. Uh, because we start at 12.15, right now it's, it's uh, one thirteen. I do have a few minutes to take questions. So. Uh, my name is Rebecca Beckel. I'm Dean of Libraries. Uh, I want to thank you so much for your talk. I'm actually going to ask that we go ahead and, and break up and that people um, continue to ask questions, but there are refreshments set up outside of the atrium. So perhaps you'll want to grab punch and cookies and bring your questions along with the refreshments. And I hope that we'll see you again as we do these every month throughout the semester. So thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.